I hate it when I'm not. Oh, there we go. <laughs> sometimes in Hollywood movies, sometimes in television commercials, even Little League baseball games, and sometimes on the comic pages of your local newspaper. Uh, I used to follow a strip called Dilbert, which is written by a guy named Scott Adams. Any Dilbert fans here? Okay, Dilbert was kind of about the workplace, kind of a comic book version of the, of the show The Office, and he was always talking to his boss or his co-workers. A little cynical, but pretty funny. But, and he rarely took on religious or spiritual themes. However, a few years ago, there was this th little three-panel strip he did. Uh, it's maybe a little bit hard to see, so I'm going to blow it up frame by frame. In the first frame, uh, Dilbert is sitting in his bed, and his dog, I think the dog's name was Dogbert, I think, is on his bed, and he announces, I've, I've decided to start a discount religion. In the next frame, his dog says, the tithing would only be 5%, and I'd let people sin as much as they want. <laughs> and in the last frame, he says, the only problem is that I don't want to spend any time with anyone who would join that sort of religion. Uh, now, I don't know anything about Scott Adams or what he believes or if he goes to church, but there is some truth to that little comic strip. And I think people uh, start their own discount religions all the time and always have. And today we begin a brand new sermon series called All Things. It comes from Paul's letter to the Colossians in the New Testament. And in a way, this whole letter is kind of about discount religion. And I'm going to begin by reading the opening lines of the letter. Then I'm going to pause, give you some background, and then we'll go on from there. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. Let's pause there. Uh, these two little verses are just a classic beginning to an ancient letter. It's the way Paul started most of his letters in the New Testament. The letters from Paul, who you know was formerly known as Saul of Tarsus, who was a highly educated, uh, fiercely passionate, one-time hater of Christ and all Christians, who then experienced a dramatic transformation on the road to Damascus when Jesus confronted him, and he became Paul, apostle to the Gentiles, still highly educated and fiercely passionate, but now following Christ. And he spent the rest of his life preaching the gospel and planting churches all over uh, Asia Minor. And his letters actually make up most of our New Testament today. It's remarkable. He wrote this particular letter to the Colossians, that is uh, a, a young church, the smallest church in a city called Colossae, in about the year 60 A.D. or so, so roughly 30 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Just to put that in perspective, I've been on staff here at Chapel Street for 33 years, so there's a time frame that people could still remember and knew people that were around when these events uh, took place. So at the, end, at, the, uh, at the time of this letter, Paul's actually under house arrest in Rome. He's awaiting trial before Caesar and likely the end of his earthly life. And he mentions Timothy, who was a younger man, uh, being mentored by Paul himself as a pastor and leader and may have actually helped Paul uh, write this letter as he was under house arrest. Now, a little geographical background here. The city of Colossae was located about 100 miles east of the great city of Ephesus. You'll see on this map, uh, it's a little blurry, but Colossae's there in the southwest quadrant, and Ephesus would have been all the way over right on the edge of the sea there in what we call now modern-day Turkey. Uh, Paul had spent some three years in Ephesus uh, preaching and building uh, uh, the church in Ephesus. We have a letter to the Ephesians in our New Testament. Uh, this is a photo of me at the site of ancient Ephesus back this past summer. And you can see by the size of those columns, ancient Ephesus was a magnificent uh, Roman city of its time. And Colossae in its heyday would have resembled Ephesus, not quite as big, but similar in style. But this is what the ancient site of Colossae looks like today. Uh, the city was destroyed by an earthquake late in the first century and was abandoned. And that's the tell, the mound of earth has never really been excavated. But at the time of Paul, Colossae was a relatively important city. Wasn't huge, but it was right on a river, the Lycus River, which meant it was a crossroads of economic trade, and more than that, uh, a crossroads of ideas, of religions and cultures and philosophy. Now, the church was planted by a man named Epaphras, who had become a follower of Jesus under Paul's preaching in Ephesus, and had traveled to Colossae and begun the church there. Now, evidently, Epaphras has traveled all the way to Rome because some things are happening in the community that he's concerned about, and he wants Paul's advice on how to help this young church. Now, why 
take time and all this historical minutia and detail? Well, because our faith as believers today in the 21st century is not anchored in a series of philosophies, a series of ideas. It's anchored in history, real time, real place, real cities, real people. And that matters, as we'll see in Paul's letter. So Colossians uh, chapter 1, we'll pick it up in verse 3. Paul writes, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel. Notice I put those words in the red. We'll come back to them. Verse 6, that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who was a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. First, I want you to see this, this whole paragraph, verse 3 through 8, is in the ancient Greek just one sentence. Okay, the, the editors have dropped in periods so we can actually make sense of it. But the words are just pouring out of Paul's mind. Uh, it, it's like he can't get the words and the concepts out fast enough. So reading Colossians, if you've tried on your own, reading this letter is a little bit like standing under a waterfall. It's, it's like trying to drink from a fire hose. And, and it will get more so over the first few chapters. It's, it's, a, it's a one fantastic letter. The, uh, secondly, I want you to see that right at the center of this opening paragraph, Paul talks about the true message of the gospel. Now, this is going to be the main theme of this whole letter, and it holds it all together. And third, notice that Paul starts really with a prayer. He wants these Colossians to know, even though he's never visited them in person, he wants them to know that he's praying for them, and he wants them to know what he's praying for them. Notice he's praying that the Colossians would be reminded of the true message of the gospel. So that's where we begin today. Point one today is the truth of the gospel. Now, we might chuckle a bit when a cartoon dog talks about starting a discount religion, but I think people do this all the time. I was in Starbucks um, a few months ago, just on my own uh, studying or something, and I overheard a conversation. I wasn't trying to overhear it, but these two younger guys, maybe late 20s are sitting at a little table for two just just right next to me so i couldn't help but overhear part of the conversation and the part of the conversation i overheard i didn't hear what was prior to this but i overheard one of the guys said this to the other guy he said i'm not sure there's a heaven but i'm pretty sure i'm going to be there he said (laughs) i'm not sure there's a heaven but i'm pretty sure i'm going to be there and i really wanted to say um excuse me i i I don't think it works that way. I don't think truth works that way. I mean, nobody would say, you know, I don't really know how this gravity thing works, but I'm just pretty sure if I jump off my house, I can fly. Nobody really says that. In his book called American Paradox, a researcher named David Myers quotes part of an interview with a young professional woman named Sheila. She said, I believe in God. I'm not a religious fanatic or anything, and I can't remember the last time I went to church, but my faith has carried me a long way. It's Sheilaism, just my own little voice. And this actually is the gospel of our culture. Listen to your own little voice of truth. We hear it all the time. Now, the issue in Colossae seems to have been exactly this type of thing. It's called syncretism, which just means a, a mishmash of current philosophies and religions from Judaism, Greek thought, and Christian teachings. Scholars think the main set of issues that they were dealing with was something called Gnosticism. It comes from the Greek word for knowledge, which is gnosis, and it was a, a, a complicated system of philosophical ideas. Let me just give you a couple of the, of the Gnostic teachings of the time, just a couple of them. First, they, they believe that physical matter, all that is that we see, uh, is evil, and only true spirit is good. Which means, therefore, that God could not have created the world. Because God is a spirit, he wouldn't have anything to do with, with created things. It means that God could not have come in the flesh, in the person of Jesus. Therefore, Jesus could not have been God. Follow? Secondly, since Jesus was not the unique son of God, he could not have truly risen from the dead, and he could not be the source of salvation. God, the true spirit, can only be found through secret mystical knowledge. That was going on at the time. So Paul begins by reminding these Colossian believers 
of the truth of the gospel. I'm going to read this, this, these verses one more time. Notice I put some other phrases in red this time, just so you can follow. Verse 3, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you've already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. Five things we see in these verses about the gospel. He's reminding them of five things. First, the gospel is about Jesus. The gospel is about Jesus. Like I said, there were all kinds of spiritual truths floating around in the ancient world. Think of it like a, like a giant spiritual salad bar, right? You know, you go buy a salad bar, you pick up a little thing here, a little thing there, and you put them in, you make your own salad. There was Greek philosophy, Gnosticism, pagan mythology, Jewish mysticism, Epaphras goes to Paul because these young believers are being confused by those teaching that Jesus was just one of many spiritual truths you could select from on the spiritual salad bar. Does that sound familiar at all? That's exactly what our world is today, especially if you go, if you've attended a major secular university or you are attending university now, this is exactly what you're taught. Sure, Jesus, he's on the Mount Rushmore of spiritual guys, but there's a lot of people up there. There's a lot of ideas up there on that Mount Rushmore of spiritual things. Jesus is just one of many places we can look for, look to for spiritual guidance. And that may be what you have uh, thought at different times in your life. It may be kind of what you assume right now. And if that's the case, you're going to see in this letter, this ancient letter, Paul is driving home the astonishing claim, the countercultural claim that Jesus is above all things, that he is before all things, that he's greater than all things and has more authority than everything else. So Paul begins by reminding them that the gospel, the good news of salvation, is about faith in Christ Jesus, period. Not Faith in ideas, not faith in philosophy, not religious rituals, not rules, but faith in a person. A person who really lived, really died, and really rose again. Secondly, he's reminding them that the gospel offers hope. The gospel offers hope. All human beings hope. It's part of what makes us uniquely human. We invest our hope in all kinds of things, in love, in relationships, in education, in science, in political systems, in social programs, in Chicago Bears. Ouch. But not all hope is the same, right? To say I hope the Bears win is much different than saying I hope God loves me. To say, for example, I hope Mitch Trubisky is, turns out to be good, you see a theme here at all? Uh, it's much different than saying, I hope I go to heaven when I die. One kind of hope is conditional and uncertain. It's just hope is wishful thinking. The other kind of hope, gospel hope, is unconditional and is certain because it's anchored, again, in a real person, in real history. The gospel offers hope. Second, thirdly, the gospel produces love. Verse 4 says, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. Paul is saying there's a direct connection between faith in Jesus and love for people. Now, we know from our previous series on neighboring that Jesus taught that the greatest commandments were love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Here, Paul is saying the same thing, only he's specifically saying love for all God's people, that is, love for those in the church. Now, let me make a comment here. Our culture, American culture, places a high value on individualism. Right? I, I do my thing, you do your thing, and we're good. I have my truth, you have your truth, we're good. And that attitude has infected how we think about spiritual things. Even among Christians, we see a tendency to separate individual faith from commitment to the community of the local church. People say, well, I follow Jesus, I believe, but you know, I, I just don't think you have to be all that involved with church stuff. I don't really trust the organizational church. Well, that kind of thinking is absolutely foreign to the Apostle Paul. It's absolutely foreign to the New Testament. The gospel produces love for God's people, love for the church. Fourth, Paul says the gospel bears fruit. 
He says, in the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world. In other words, you're not alone. You're not alone believing the gospel in your little, little neck of the woods in Colossae, in your little church at Mill Creek. You're not alone. The gospel is growing all over the world. That is growing with Jewish background believers and Greek background believers and Romans and pagans and cultures and languages far away from you. Here's a point of interest. The common narrative right now about Christianity and our culture, one of them is that it's just too narrow. It's just too exclusive. It's actually not true. It's actually exactly the opposite. In the course of the last few years, I've had the privilege of traveling to places around the world. I've visited churches in South America, Europe, Russia, Turkey, Dubai, Africa, and China. And the Christian gospel is growing in all those places simultaneously because the Christian gospel is not ethnocentric. It's not bound by culture. For example, over 90% of the Muslims in the world live in one narrow swath of, of the world's surface. Basically, the Middle East slightly expanded. 95% of all Hindus live in India. But Christianity is spread almost equally between North America, South America, uh, Asia, and Africa. Why is that? Because the gospel is not defined by culture. It's not defined by ethnicity. It doesn't come with cultural baggage. It's not based on religious practice. It's anchored in something called grace. And that's the fifth thing about the gospel Paul reminds them of, is that the gospel is God's grace, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. Now, grace is an amazing word. We take it for granted. Grace is undeserved favor. It's a gift, can be earned or deserved, and grace is what makes the Christian gospel so radically different than every other religious idea in the history of the world. Paul is reminding these Colossians, and he's reminding us of the truth of the gospel. The second thing we see in this passage is that Paul prays that the Colossians would live the life of the gospel. That's the second thing today, the life of the gospel. Uh, years ago, my dad was pastor of a small church in Orlando, Florida, or just outside of Orlando. And to this day, he still tells a story about an elder in his church, a leader, who uh, one day was driving home from work on a Friday, I believe. It was in the summer, so it was hot. I think his car conditioning wasn't working, and it was a, it was a traffic jam getting home. And so he was just uh, kind of out of sorts, and some knucklehead cuts him off in traffic. And he just kind of blew a gasket. He just honked at the guy, just immediately honked because he's mad. And the guy gestured back at him out his window, like, what's up with that? So he honks again, twice. The guy gestures at him again. And then he starts honking, repeatedly telling the guy, pull over, pull over, pull over, let's settle this. Gets the guy, they both pull over on the side of the road, two adult men in public. And they get out of their cars, and they begin screaming at each other. Never came to blows, but an ugly, ugly scene. Well, that happened. Fast forward to Sunday. It was a communion Sunday, like we're going to share communion here today. And this particular elder was assigned to serve which meant in their tradition, he took the trays and he walked back through the aisle and he got about two thirds of the way down the aisle and the first person he handed the bre bread tray to was that guy from the side of the road who had visited the church for the first time that Sunday. Problem. Now to his credit, uh, he <laughs> service was over, he went straight to my dad's office. I think he might even drag the other guy with him and they had a conversation and eventually they, they actually became good friends. So, uh, so, so, so good on them. But he knew that his life had not demonstrated the life of Jesus. Verse 9, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. The life of the gospel is, first of all, a life filled with knowledge. Filled with knowledge. Now, I don't know about you, but my my head is filled with all sorts of relatively useless knowledge. When I was in college, some buddies and I who love sports, we'd, we had this little trivia game we'd play. You just hollered out uh, some ex-pro athlete's name, and the game was who could remember his uniform number. That's what we did. So it'd be Willie Mays, 24, or Joe DiMaggio, 5, or Jerry West, anybody, 44. And we do it endlessly. I don't know why that stuff's in my head. I don't know why I can remember that stuff, but I do. Maybe you have something like that too. Maybe it's, maybe it's lyrics from 70s songs. Maybe you've memorized the dialogue from The Princess Bride. Anybody? Okay. 
Paul says, be filled with knowledge. And the word he uses here is interesting. It's epigenosis, which means knowledge, but it means more than knowing facts. It means more than knowing information. It carries with it a sense of, of depth and intensity, sort of experiential knowledge. Not knowing Willie Mays' number, but knowing Willie Mays. See, the Gnostic teacher said you need knowledge. You need special knowledge. Paul says, yeah, you need knowledge, but not some, some metaphysical, philosophical knowledge only available to philosophers and theologians. You need knowledge of God and his will. He says, which you gain through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. He says, be so filled with the knowledge that comes to us from Christ, through Christ, that you are saturated by it, and it therefore leaks into your life and changes the way you live, the way you behave. And that leads to the second thing, the life of the gospel is a life that is worthy. A life that is worthy. The reason that elder years ago went to, to my dad's office after seeing the guy in church is that he knew his behavior was not worthy of the gospel. His behavior is not worthy of Christ himself. Paul says that a life that is worthy is a life that bears fruit in every good work. Later in his letter to the Galatian church, Paul would say the fruit of the Spirit, in other words, in other words what God wants to grow in all of us by his Holy Spirit all the time is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. So being filled with the knowledge of God's will produces good fruit in the way we live. He's talking about spiritual maturity, which is why we say, as Sterling said earlier today, we want to be a place where we experience grace, but more than that, grow in faith and make an impact. Thirdly, we see here the power of the gospel. Paul reminds them of the power of the gospel. Verse 11, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience. Notice, Paul recognizes that these believers in Colossae need to be strengthened, need to have the power and the endurance to stand firm in a hostile culture. So imagine standing firm, holding your ground when the winds of a storm are blowing around you. That's in Paul's mind. Now he tells them where that strength comes from, verse 12. And giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. I want you to notice here that the power to endure comes from three things that have already happened. He says, who has qualified you, that's who, who, who's made you sufficient to share in the inheritance of his holy people. That's, that's talking about the hope of heaven. He says, who has rescued us from darkness. That means to snatch out of danger and bring to yourself. Remember those boys who were trapped in that cave in Thailand last year? This is the image. You've been rescued out of darkness, and somebody has carried you back to himself. Third, he says, we have redemption. We've been ransomed. We have the forgiveness of sins. Notice. Here's what we need to see. All these are said in the past tense. Paul's talking about the past tense. These have already happened. We already have these things. So here's what the Colossian believers were wrestling with. They were being told that Jesus wasn't enough. They were being told that Jesus was just one of many ways, uh, that, that their faith in him was foolish, that he could not possibly have been God. They were being told they needed more special knowledge, they needed to practice religious rituals and observe certain food laws and all sorts of things. We're going to hear about them later in the series. And I think that's what many of us struggle with today, especially our younger people, especially our students middle school and high school and college. You're being told Jesus is just one of many. He's just one of many. They all go to the same place. You're being told, listen to your own little voice of truth. You have a little voice of truth. Listen to that. Paul says, no. No. There is truth, but it's not found in yourself. There is truth. It's not found looking for philosophies. There is truth, and it's in a person. Most of us saw the story that unfolded in Dallas, I think it was, uh, a couple of weeks ago. The police officer who was uh, convicted of shooting an unarmed man in an apartment, you know, a tragic, terrible story. 
Uh, at the victim impact hearing then you saw the members of the deceased man's family were given the opportunity to speak. Uh, and then the man's younger brother, 18 years old, surprised the court because instead of uh, the typical statement filled with anger and resentment and bitterness, he said, I want you to know I forgive you, he said. And I know if you go to God, he will forgive you if you ask him. And he didn't stop there. Then he said, and I think giving your life to Christ would be the best thing that my brother would want you to do. And then he asked the judge if he could give this woman, the convicted, a woman convicted of murder, if he could give her a hug. And he embraced her. If you've seen the video, it's quite moving. Now that story uh, sparked all kinds of reaction all across social media, mostly because of the racially charged aspect of the story. But the strongest reaction was astonishment. Like, how could he? How could he forgive the person who killed his brother? Did she qualify for that forgiveness? Uh-uh, no. Could she rescue herself from the darkness of her own guilt and shame? No. Could she forgive and redeem herself? No. Those things could only be done by someone else for her. And so it is with each one of us. The gospel tells us he has qualified you. He has rescued you. In him you have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That's grace. And when we receive that grace, we then have the power to live a life worthy of the gospel. You bow with me. I hope you stay with us through this series. Lord Jesus, thank you today for your word. Thank you for this ancient letter written to people so different from us, but yet so like us. We live in a world full of confusing ideas and conflicting claims of truth. Help us to anchor our faith and our lives in your truth. Help us to discover the power of your grace and help us to live lives worthy of the gospel, worthy of Christ himself. In your name we pray.